Hello and welcome back to The World This Week with me, Jonathan Steele. Four years ago, disputed elections in Iran saw the birth of the opposition Green Movement. The crackdown that followed led to thousands of arrests and tens or even hundreds of deaths. But tomorrow, Iranians head to the polls again to vote for a new president. It's the end of the line for current president Ahmadinejad. But will his replacement make any difference to Iran's beleaguered economy and fraught international relations? Emily Churchill has more. They've battled it out on live TV. But tomorrow, six candidates face the real test as Iranians head to the polls in the first presidential election since Ahmadinejad's disputed victory in 2009. Six years since he became president for the second time, Ahmadinejad is not allowed to stand again. But the change of presidency is unlikely to bring any radical changes to the political landscape in Iran or its relations with the West, not least because the candidates have all been vetted by Iran's Guardian Council, which approved just eight out of almost 700 applicants. That said, some excitement has been building around the most moderate of the six remaining candidates, Hassan Rouhani, who received a boost when the reformist Mohammad Reza Arif bowed out of the race on Tuesday. Rouhani was head of the National Security Council when he addressed this rally in 2005. Now a presidential hopeful, he's promised reconciliation with foreign powers and to improve Iran's battered economy, arguably the key issue of the election. We need to get away from extremism. And this also relates to foreign policy. We should maintain the country's interests and national security so as to provide conditions where we create opportunities for people to participate politically, economically and socially. Iran's supreme leader, Ayatollah Khamenei, denies supporting any candidate in particular. But the hardline nuclear negotiator Saeed Jalili is thought to be his preferred choice. At a time when some friends were calling for cooperation and saying we should avoid unnecessary confrontations with them, what were the results? During the term of Mr. Hashemi, there were two arrest warrants, and during the term of Mr. Katami, after all the cooperation on Afghanistan, they called us the axis of evil. I am not saying that their comments were right or that the arrest warrants were rightly issued, both were wrong. The point is that this method is wrong. If we want to pursue this method, we will see those results. Reformist voices in Iran are divided over whether or not to take part in the elections. Some think reformists have a duty to make themselves heard at the ballot box, but others, angry at government control over the media and the electoral process, are calling for a boycott. But whoever takes Ahmadinejad's place in parliament this week, ultimate power over key issues like nuclear policy and relations with the West will remain, not with a new president, but with the country's supreme leader. Emily Churchill. Islam channel. So who is, who is going to win tomorrow and how much does it matter? With me to discuss these important questions, I'm pleased to welcome Yasmin Mather, chair of the campaign group Hands Off the People of Iran, Dr. Cameron Mateen, lecturer in international relations at the University of Sussex and author of the book Recasting Iranian Modernity, International Relations and Social Change, and finally, Dr. Saeed Shahabi, activist and political commentator. Welcome to you all. Let me start with you, Dr. Cameron Matin. What are the big issues for the average Iranian voter? I think the, the biggest issue for most Iranians at the moment is, is the economy. The, the sanctions, the devaluation of Iranian currency, um, the sanctions even on, on uh, medical medicine and, and various uh, medical uh, equipments for hospitals to operate properly. These are all issues which Iranians uh, face on a daily basis, and especially for the working class and the lower uh, and the poor, the poor of, of Iranian society. Well, you society. mentioned sanctions. Let me, yeah. if I d can just interrupt. Sure. Do people blame the West or the international community for putting on the sanctions, or do they blame the government for allowing the sanctions to be put uh, on? Well, it's difficult to say, but from what we can see on the media, that depending on where you are in the, within, the, within the social uh, structure, you would have a different perspective. Um, uh, I think w within the middle class and upper middle class, people tend to see the mismanagement of the state as also as partially responsible. But for, for most people who do not have access to, to, uh, to media, uh, independent media, probably they, they tend to buy into the, the government's um, um, uh, line of argument, which I think um, to some extent correctly identifies the sanctions as, as the, uh, the main, main cause of the, of the economic 
problems. But the thing is, even during the time there was no, no sanctions, the still Iranian society was highly polarized in terms of class issues. And under the reformist governments, unfortunately, the seeds of the ascendancy of Ahmadinejad and his faction was actually sown by, by the almost neoliberal um, economic reforms which, which was undertaken under Afsanjani and Khatami. Uh, and that really pushed the uh, lower classes towards the populist discourse of, of the type of, of Ahmadinejad. Yeah, yes, I mean, let me turn to you. Um, I mean, how important are these elections? I mean, will it make a difference who wins? Is there really a, a choice for the, for the average voter? I don't think they will make much of a difference. There are uh, differences in presentation rather than in real content. Uh, on the issue of the economy, rightly pointed out by Kamran Matin, I think economy is so tied in now with international relations, it's so tied in with the issue of sanctions, that although all the candidates are giving uh, slogans about improving the economy, very few of them have really said much about what can be done in terms of improving negotiations. We saw Mr. Rouhani, but he hasn't really got a plan. One thing that we should remember is also the fact that irrespective of who is elected in Iran, the United States seems to have made up its mind that unless Iran's supreme leader, Ayatollah Khamenei, changes his position on the nuclear issue, there won't be much of a difference. So because of those factors, I would say it doesn't make a big difference. It will make a difference maybe in terms of how uh, negotiations are uh, carried on in the initial stages of the next round. But at the end of the day, the uh, decision, the way those negotiations will go forward will depend on what the Supreme Leader tells the negotiator to do. So, so doesn't that mean, uh, Dr. Shihabi, that really the, the voters don't have much of a choice because uh, the man who's going to take the decisions isn't up for election. It's these six people who will do pretty much what he wants. Is, is that uh, caricature or is that fair? I think the situation in Iran is very similar to the situation in the UK, in, in America, where the, ch the choices are limited. Whether you, ch uh, if you, if you, if you elect Mr. Cameron or you elected Mr. Blair, the the the, word, the Britain is not going to change fundamentally. Whether you uh, elect Mr. Obama or Mr. Bush, the, the differences are minute. The, the system itself is not going to be shaken. Now, the same thing happens in Iran, but of course, I think the significance of uh, Iranian election can be evaluated and seen and appreciated uh, f uh, by looking at how the West is perceiving it, how it is following it, how the media is concentrating on what is going to happen in Iran. Definitely, if Mr. Rouhani wins, uh, it would be different uh, than if Mr. Jalili wins. They have slightly, well, not very slightly, but there is some... A uh, considerable difference in approach, whether it is in approach to the international relations, to the issue of um, nuclear power, or the issue of economy. So I think it matters to the individual uh, Iranian uh, voter, and also it matters to the regional powers and to the West. But do, you, but do you think it's fair that <clears throat> somebody should have the power to disqualify candidates just like that without giving any reasons publicly at all. I mean, you know, there are only six candidates. There were eight at the beginning out of 700 who applied. I mean, why should one group of people, the Guardianship Council and particularly the Supreme Leader who chairs it, have that power? Well, I think they have a system uh, in place. Uh, I cannot defend or attack that system, but I... I do not think in any country in the world you have more than three or four or five uh, candidates. So when you have eight candidates in Iran, uh, or now six, they have dropped out. Originally, I think they, they approved of around 10. Uh, I think this is in line with the international norms. How they disqualify this or that uh, rests with the system itself. Whether it is fair or not, at the end of the day, you are having both uh, both camps campaigning. Whether you have three from the reformists or two, I think uh, essentially it does not matter that much because I think also they have their standards that this man has done this and he is not qualified. And I do not believe that the Supreme Leader himself really goes into the detail of each of them 
because the, the Guardian Council is made of 12 but, people. But there was the big issue two or three weeks ago when the former president, Rafsanjani, put forward his candidacy. Nobody could say he's not qualified or he doesn't know anything about foreign affairs or the economy, and yet he was disqualified without any reason being given. I mean, can that be justified? Well, I'm sure they, they gave him the reason. I don't think they just... Uh, I, I'm sure they, uh, they know why or the, what the reason is, but I well, think... Well, what is the reason? I think we, I think the reason was, uh, in, from my own perspective, is that he had taken a negative line towards the system. What what they perceive, what the readership perceives as the system, whether that is uh, logical or not. But what he did in uh, five, four years ago, when he stood with the other party, with the uh, reformist uh, party, I do not. I'm not sa saying that it was right or wrong. I'm saying that. The regime looks at Rafsanjani as uh, potentially a dangerous element because he did not stand with the system at the, ta at the hour of need. It may be wrong, it may be right. Well, but you're you're shaking disagree. your head, I would dis disagree with this. In fact, Rafsanjani did his best to calm down the situation in 2009. He considers himself a centrist and he acted as a centrist. Uh, so to blame him for the for participating in 2009, I don't think it's fair. Uh, it, many of us criticized him. I think the opposition movement criticized him for standing for the system. And, and in fact, his main slogan was, uh, don't protest, don't shout slogans. Even if you look at the leaders of the Green Movement, they, did, they weren't challenging the Islamic Republic of Iran. They wanted reform within the Islamic Republic of Iran. One issue is that one we should also remember is that women are not allowed to be candidates in this election. There were 30 women who applied. They were all dismissed because of their gender. The Constitution is very clear on that. Uh, while um, there is no rational reason why that should happen. I would add to this the fact that fear of demonstrations in case a candidate wants reform within a system uh, is not a very good reason for banning them from that election. Um, and it has made this election more of a, um, a, a less exciting election. We are looking at rather mediocre candidates who are not very good at uh, public speaking, and they haven't managed to enthuse the population except on Tuesday when one of them dropped out of the election. But that's not really uh, the well, way... Well, let, let me ask Dr. Martin about that. I yeah. mean, because we did see on the clip the part of the one of the TV yes. debates, and I believe if there's a second round, the top two will also debate. And, yeah. and some of the exchanges have been pretty open. I mean, I believe one of the candidates, Ali Akbar Velayati, really criticized Jalili's negotiating yeah. stance quite recently uh, with the West, saying that you expect them to take 100 steps and you've only taken three steps. How can you yeah. negotiate on that basis? So it's been a pretty big sort of ding-dong battle. Yeah. Uh, so in that sense, there is an element of democracy at least, isn't there? Well, uh, the thing is, the, historically, the, um, the turnout in election is of, of utmost importance for, for, for the system, for the, for the regime as a whole, because um, coming out of a most popular revolution in modern times, the regime takes it is, its legitimacy at least every four years from, from the participation of people in the elections. So in order to encourage people to participate, they have to give certain, um, uh, certain signals that this is a competitive election, there are differences between candidates. So um, I think if you look at every election around the time of the election, that there are some opening in the political atmosphere and there are different candidates. Uh, that's not to say that there isn't, these differences are not, um, not substantive or they are not real. But these differences are controlled and managed in a very, very meticulous way. And uh, in the end of the day, um, if you compare even with the last elections, the, what is being said and what is being discussed and the way it's been discussed is extremely different because the regime has, has experienced how uh, um, a, a population which is encouraged and, and enthused, as, as, as um, Yasamin said, might get out of control. So there is a degree of, of competition within within a particular but very well-defined limit. In, in these debates, for example, uh, sanctions and the economy are big issues. Have, yes. have any of these six candidates said that 
it's sort of our fault or it's our government's fault that we've got these sanctions and that we've got such bad relations with the international community. Well, we must do something about it or is all the, the whole issue, you know, the, yes. the outside community has to change, not we? Well, the, in the case of two of them, at least, Velayati and Rouhani, they implicitly, in some cases, explicitly have have blamed um, Mr. Jalili and, and the, the current team of negotiations as partially responsible by being being not diplomats really, just reading out statements about their positions instead of actually ent entering into a bargaining uh, process with the Western Western countries. But um, I think this this is really interesting, the difference between Velayati and Jalili, because everybody, until the last few weeks, they were they thought that actually Jalili is the is the candidate of the supreme leader. But we know that Velayati is also very close to supreme leader. So the fact that Velayati actually is openly criticizing Jalili, I think, indicates that supreme leader is also not someone who is making decisions entirely on its own. There are factions within the state, especially revolutionary guards and intelligence and military, who clearly have a, a stake in, in a more adventurous foreign policy, which legitimizes their own domination of Iranian economy, and hence they are much more averse mm. to normalizing relation and, and giving concessions in, in terms of nuclear program. But on the other hand, one of the constituencies of Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei from the time he was actually president in the 80s is the traditional uh, middle class bourgeoisie of the bazaar. And obviously they have taken hit of the sanctions. So Khamenei has to really navigate between this traditional bazaar merchant mercantile class who are quite you know, powerful within, within the apparatus of the state and the more uh, recent um, key actors in Iranian politics and economy, I revolutionary guards, their, their, their higher mm -hmm. echelons. And, I think the Jalili and Velayati represent these two different type of, of intra-regime actors. Mm -hmm. and th they are still quite distinguished from the reformist or the pragmatist camps in many ways. Nonetheless, they, they, are, they, they have also differences within themselves. But um, l Let me yes. just turn to another point, actually, because we haven't got too much time. Yeah. Um, the whole issue of popular mobilization and so on that we saw in 2009 and then the sort of severe crackdown and arrests and so on. You think that, I mean, most analysts seem to be saying nothing like that's going to happen this time. Is, is that a, a correct prediction, do you think? Nobody can predict exactly what's going to happen, but it is unlikely that there will be major upheaval like, like before, because first the people do not, want, do not have stomach for more demonstrations. And I don't think any of the candidates themselves are in that position, or in a position to, uh, to, 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 to call for more disturbances, because they saw what happened in 2009 uh, has backfired on, all, on everyone, uh, on the regime, and also on those candidates who th thought that they were uh, aggrieved by the, by the results. So I do not th anticipate much. It, it doesn't look like it at the moment. Of course, after the, fir the first round, the, the, the situation will become clearer. But I believe also the Iranians are very subtle people. They are not just revolutionaries and that's it. They, are all, they have minds, they have... It is a, it is a historical uh, society with uh, deep civilization. And these people... But, uh, Mr. Shabi, revolutionaries are not mindless. Yeah. Uh, you are implying that people who are actually revolting, they somehow uh, are irrational. No, I'm but, saying that uh, generally, I, I said the Iranians all together, collectively, are a country of civilization. And yes, the people indeed, are yeah. heavyweight. They are not, they cannot just be uh, driven into um, senseless movements, yeah. whether it is against or for the regime. Yeah. So I think even they see something wrong, they will stand against it, I, whether yeah. it is from... But people uh, are now saying in the demonstrations, we see people saying we are hungry. Right? Um, Kamran rightly pointed out that people are dying because of sanctions. And none of the candidates are saying we will make a substantial change in the politics that we follow. There is no hope that there will be any improvement in the economy. The neoliberal economy is going to be the policy of both sides, whoever wins this election. And therefore, I think there is a limit until which people will tolerate the kind of sufferings they've suffered in the last 12 months, I would say. It's it, the hardship, the uh, hard, financial hardship, lack of basic food, ha inflation that's spiraling day by day, in addition to political dictatorship, will make people impatient because they were hoping for change. 
during this. Yeah, these but, but do you think people will therefore not vote? In fact, I, I believe you support the idea of a boycott. Is that right? I think some people will vote. The question is that when it will become clear that the vote didn't matter, that, it, that the vote as the government itself puts it is being engineered, uh, the terms they are using, then people will be, will be opposing what is happening, whether it's one week <coughs> after this election. Yeah, may, may I just add that the, 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 the tragedy of reformist strategy in Iran since 1997 is really that there is this, this massive potential for popular support because of economic issues. But they, are, they have no clear strategy, an economic policy which is substantively different from the existing policies. And therefore, they can't really connect with the, with the majority of Iranian people who are actually suffering from sanctions and economic situation. And this is precisely where the populist um, slogans and the, the social justice idea, which is much more prominent in, in the campaign of, let's say, Jalili or Ahmadinejad in the past, the, the, the slogan against corruption, these slogans speak much more easily to the, to the poor in the Iranian society. And the constituency, which uh, naturally would, would belong to a reformist progressive policy, is not actually behind them. And that's why in 2009, um, the green movement was really ultimately broken down because there was no connect between urban middle class and the and the urban poor. This, this disconnect is is really at the root of the reformist uh, defeat, and they really have no neither will nor desire actually to to change that their stance on economic uh, policies, which which. Uh, which is central to, I think, in any yeah, election. But then, on the other hand, the populist message has been discredited because Ahmadinejad pushed it forward. He had eight he years didn't in power. Do it, Very little has changed. So, the, 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 well, the issue is in an in, in rentier economy like Iran, where where the eighty-five percent of Iranian economic revenue comes from oil, and the redistribution of this oil on an ad hoc basis at the key conjunctures of Iranian uh, history. Is, is an instrument which actually can mobilize people simply because people are so desperate. If somebody comes along and tells you and actually gives you oil money, which Ahmadinejad in fact in some, in some, in some uh, measure did in the last elections and mobilized lots of poor, uh, poor people in the, in, the, in the large cities and, in the small, in, and also in, in, in rural Iran, that can have an effect, not because uh, people are necessarily you know, supporting for that particular line of policy. It's because that at that particular time, there is a concrete um, improvement for a temporary period in their livelihood, which then again, it's, it can be, you know, um, arbitrarily withdrawn. That's what happened under Ahmadinejad. Uh, in the gonna, <coughs> we've got very little time. I'm gonna ask you a very unfair question, the same one to all three of you. Who are the two candidates who are gonna come out top tomorrow? Well, it's difficult to say, but I believe <laughs> that, I think Jalili and Rouhani may come on the floor. What do you think? Um, based on what I see on the media, I think uh, Rouhani and Qalibaf will be going well, to the second round. At least you disagree. Round. So. Uh, I might say Velayati and Qalibaf, but I'm oh, Well, I'm we've got, we've got five up. options out of that. So I think this shows that if whatever you <laughs> no, can say about the Iranian system, not it is unpredictable. and <laughs> We just don't know what's going to happen. Although you think at least that there will not be the same violence and protests uh, as we saw last year. So on that note, uh, let's wait and see who does in fact come out on top. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Yasmin Mather, Kamran Matin and uh, Saeed Shahabi. Thank you. And thank you very much for watching.